All right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining. Uh, my name is Fred Lapola. I'm a librarian in the Health, uh, Health Sciences Library here at NYU Langone. And so this, I guess, is probably the fifth, uh, or in any event, uh, fourth or fifth uh, workshop that we're doing, class that we're doing on R, uh, introductory R uh, for RNA sequence analysis, or just for sequence analysis in general. Uh, so for those of you who have joined us so far, just to sort of recap, We've talked about, we started out talking about generally what R is, then we moved into pulling and loading and data, talked about the different data types that are available. And then last week we started talking about different functions, uh, which are basically sets of commands to tell R to do some sort of analysis for us. Uh, and we had talked about apply, a common set of sort of a family of um, commands that can be used for running a, an, a, a function over multiple columns or rows of our data, uh, as well as for, for loops, which are a common, another way of doing something similar where you're sort of saying, repeat this action uh, over and over as long as certain circumstances are met. Uh, so I wanna start off with some review. Uh, so again, for those of you who have, I mean, everyone's on a device, obviously, but uh, feel free to log in at menti.com and go to 641242. Uh, and yeah, so first thing, just thinking back to when we talked about the different data structures, uh, what is the difference between a matrix and a data frame? It seems like everybody pretty much has this one, which is great. Uh, and this will, especially as you move into more of the sequencing work, will become more apparent why it is important to double check that you are, when doing that sort of uh, things like making heat maps, for example, that you really double check what type of data you're working with. For other things, uh, it may not be as uh, essential, um, but it is always helpful to at least know what you're working with because they behave differently and they'll allow you to do different types of analysis. Uh, so let's say you weren't sure what type of data, either it was in a column or you were looking for the entire data structure. What command would you use? Great, and everyone, uh, for the most part I'm seeing is uh, class, uh, which can actually be used more, it's more of a logical uh, operator. So if you wanted to pull out an index of, uh, of for example, rows that met some criteria, which rows have you know a value less than x you could do that it would give you a set of true and false but then you could use that to create for example a subset of the data that met certain criteria but in general class is what we're going to going to be what we would use if we wanted to know for example was our nyc data that we used in the past weeks was that a data frame was that a matrix and so on uh, so let's say you had you you're learning about R, you saw in some code that somebody had posted maybe on Stack Exchange, a function and you had never heard of it. For example, they, they posted, uh, we'll use an easy one, t-test and you wanted more information. What could you type in? Yes, excellent. So yeah, I'm very glad that I'm seeing everybody's getting that right. You will use the question mark, it opens in the help window. Very essential as we're going through since there's no need to, no need and probably no possibility of memorizing all of these functions. Uh, so we talked about apply a little bit in the past uh, uh, past week. Uh, so which of these commands would you use? Let's say you wanted to get the median of four columns, six, seven, eight, and nine. Which of these options would you use? And I realize this might be a little bit tricky because it is so small. Uh, and I mean, also you could try it out if you didn't remember. Tie so far, oh, the tie is broken. And yeah, option A is pulling ahead. So really the thing I, I want you to remember since it's not really necessary to memorize the, the margin or the second number that one and two are rows and columns, but that apply is going to work by taking in some set of data. So in this case, NYC comma six through nine. So that's gonna be the sixth, seventh, eighth and ninth columns. We give it a two, meaning the, uh, the column. So going down the columns, uh, to take the median and then median and then na dot rm equals true. That's really just an additional um, argument that's being passed to median so that we know not to worry about those uh, blank values. 
Okay, so that is it for my review questions. So last week uh, we talked about, oh, and uh, something I forgot to mention this time, but has been true throughout. If as I'm going through, something is unclear, definitely feel free to post a question about it in the, uh, the Zoom chat uh, that comes with, with Zoom. That's the easiest way probably, uh, and we have TAs on the line who should be able to uh, help or at least point you in the right direction. That said, I definitely would recommend before doing that, this can be a great opportunity to try out Googling errors that you might get as well as double checking for typos. I would say nine times out of 10, if not 99 times out of 100, when we have errors, it's a typo. And then on top of that, uh, often it can be a really good practice. I mean, in, you know, when you're actually going out and doing this in your own work, there will not be TAs. And so it can be really helpful to check out how people are talking about the problems in a, on a site like Stack Overflow. We have our class Stack Overflow, but it's part of a, a broader uh, service, I guess, a broader message board system that exists for asking and posting questions. So that can also be a really good thing to do. Try searching for your specific error in R. Uh, so going forward, uh, so we talked a little bit about for loops was where we had left off. Uh, and some of the examples we were showing should be noted would be less efficient than if you had uh, sort of used R's internal language, uh, used a concept called vectorization. So here's an example of a for loop we used last week. So we said for I in one through 10. So it's gonna start at one, it's gonna count up by uh, increments of one until it reaches 10. Multiply I by three, so it'll start with one times three, and then plug that into I and print it out. So just put it in the, uh, the results. So it's saying three, and then it's adding one, so it becomes two, two times three is six, and so on. So there are cases where a for loop might be useful and might be the only way or the most straightforward way to do something, but it is always important to remember as well that R does have uh, functionality built in for doing these sorts of equations on its own. So if we just had a vector of one through 10 and multiply that vector by three, it's going to just sort of go along each item anyways and multiply that by three. Uh, if we had, if it was not just three, say we were multiplying a vector by a vector, uh, it would recycle through. So if it was three comma two, say it was a two item, then it would go uh, three, four, nine, eight, and so on. So it sort of trades off as it were. Uh, but the, the point I'm bringing this up is that using these sort of built in functionality of uh, R will be faster than writing for loops and ultimately I think a lot less frustrating for you, the user. Uh, so basically, yeah, don't use a loop if there's an alternative, like just doing the one through 10. Another thing which we didn't really talk about, but so as you may have noted in, for example, this example here, going back a page, each of these numbers is assigned a number one. So you can think of that one as sort of the first line of output of R. And so the fact that it keeps giving us a one means that every time it runs, it's sort of throwing out what it had, and this is the first of the second round. So there isn't at the end of this, a list of numbers three through 30. Uh, instead, it sort of did, the, did the, the math that we have up here, it produced three, it added one to, to I to go on to two, and then it overwrote what it had. So this doesn't really exist anywhere. So sometimes you'll see in code, uh, people will run the loop and every time they take that number and they use something like C or C bind, R bind to add that object onto the end of our, uh, of a, uh, for example, a vector. Uh, and in general, it's considered not really the most optimal. It's going to use up a lot of your memory. In the case of something as small as what we just saw on the previous page, probably isn't going to make a big difference. But if you're doing something very time consuming and large, it might really bog down your machine and be very frustrating. Uh, so another alternative is just create an empty object at the beginning uh, and have it fill in as you go along. So you could say create a vector. So this is the command vector mode numeric length 99 creates an empty vector. So it's just sort of creating this space that numbers could populate from that. You could do the same thing with a matrix. Uh, so you could do matrix, uh, the numbers, uh, so it's going to be 12 long with four rows. So it's got four rows, that means it has three columns because it's, it's 12 
uh, cells, basically. If we scroll down just to talk a little bit more, we could do, and I, there's definitely got to be a more uh, elegant way than what I did here, but uh, you could create this vector. And so for this range, and I chose this just because it was um, new, all numeric values. Uh, and so then I said, take the standard deviation of that, uh, that column and then just feed it into uh, this test vector that we've created. And that way you're not building a new uh, test vector each time. Then the next thing was we just assigned the names. And so I printed it out so you could see it. Names can be a nice uh, function for both assigning names. So sometimes we'll have, for example, a matrix that we've read in from somewhere and we want to assign the names. Maybe they weren't a part of it. We could give it a list or a, uh, a vector of, uh, of text basically that corresponds to each column or row. The other nice thing too, when we're exploring our data or more to the point when we are analyzing our data and we don't remember exactly how say a given column was spelled, we can run names of that and it will print all of the names and that can be helpful for getting a sense of, uh, a sense of things. Okay. Uh, so there's also a uh, sort of, I'm not sure if it's technically related aside from that it's always sort of discussed in conjunction with for loops are if statements. Uh, if statement is saying, it basically you're setting some condition. So if some condition is met, do something, otherwise do something else. It's a very common uh, function that's both taught in uh, coding classes. So if you're either in taking, if you've taken any other languages, I'm, I strongly suspect you may have seen something equivalent in those languages. And this is one option we have for, for example, uh, dichotomizing certain va variables. So sometimes it will be beneficial to us to say, assign some sort of threshold where above a given threshold, you know, in this case that I have on the screen, we've said it's high cholesterol, below it is not. And that can help for our analysis to kind of simplify things down when we have a whole range, but we're really only interested in sort of using that as uh, one of two groups, which can make th doing things like for example, a t-test uh, could be easier because we could then say, you know, we're interested in some value uh, comparing the high cholesterol people to the lower cholesterol people, for example. Or similarly, we want to see if there a correlation between what we're calling broadly high cholesterol and say diabetes or not. Uh, and so having this dichotomy could be useful. So here, the first thing I did was just this na.omit. Uh, I, I'm not sure if we've talked about na.omit, another very common function. Uh, and na.omit basically says, go through this entire, in this case, this entire data frame, all of the NYC data, uh, and remove any NAs. Uh, and so anywhere it finds a row with an NA, it tosses it out. So in some cases, this might be a bit uh, aggressive. So sometimes you might just want to run this over, for example, a certain column. Since for this, we're just really doing it for instruction purposes and it doesn't really, we're not too concerned if we're losing relatively more data. I've just done it for the whole uh, NYC and, and overwritten NYC. So now there's no rows that contain um, blank NA data. So here going through again, if you recall from past week, so uh, when we do that, so I'll actually just do it here, NYC, na.omit NYC, that tosses them out. So it's saying now there's actually 1,112. So it's actually going too high. So it may have been based on the previous one. Uh, it's saying if this first item, comma, do the second item, otherwise or else do the third thing. So if in this column, NYC total cholesterol, and it's actually saying to go to the row. So that's why it goes so high because it's going down through the rows. If you find a value, that's over 200, create this new column, high cholesterol, and in that same row, give it a one. But if it's not above 200, give it a zero. And so what this would do is this would tack on a 24th column. Let me actually just go ahead and do it. And it should say, uh, if the cholesterol is over 200, they have high cholesterol. If not, they have a, a zero, basically. So if we wanted to just sort of see that, we could say head NYC, 
And now we've got this new item at the end. Let's see if it actually worked. Hopefully it did. Otherwise, uh, uh, this will be not ideal. My mouse is being a little bit strange on this space. Uh, but we could also just do, uh, let's see, summary NYC dollar. Well, that won't do it exactly. Oh, yeah. Head NYC dollar cholesterol total. I think we shouldn't have an issue if we use that C, which again is the way of combining things. Uh, of course, it has not given us the uh, labels that did not do what I was hoping it would do. So maybe I'll just separate this into two commands. Head and head NYC dollar. So yeah, there's only one above 200, one with high, so it's sort of dichotomized this. And this could make our life a little bit easier when it comes time to analyze. So again, with this if else argument, it's gonna say, look at the first statement. If it's true, do one thing. If it's not true, do another. Uh, and that could be a nice option for uh, working with our data. Uh, I see there's a question, if you used NA omit, uh, for one of the columns, uh, that is correct. It would just look within that one column, I believe. That's how it should work, is my understanding. Uh, and remove any col any. So, for example, if we did NYC dollar cholesterol, uh, it would look for the uh, NAs there and get rid of those rows. Uh, so, so far we've talked. So we've gone over different ways, sort of, to use things like apply. Uh, for loops and if else. And I think it can be actually also really helpful at this point, especially since I think for a lot of people, particularly starting out, although talking about for loops and if statements are kind of very bread and butter for working with uh, coding and working with data analysis in this way, I think it's also good to sort of take a breath and be aware that there are sort of built in sets of commands that can make our life a lot um, easier uh, when it comes to doing some of these data cleaning activities. Uh, so one package, which we talked about, I think on the first day or maybe the second day, uh, is called Tidyverse, which I really like. Uh, and basically, this is a collection of packages. Uh, I think they're all written by an individual named Hadley Wickham, who's sort of a, uh, a big figure in the R universe. Uh, and they, so if you were to go ahead and install it, so again, uh, as a reminder, the install.packages in quotes tidyverse, but then if you were to run it, library tidyverse, it goes ahead and tells us that it's got a couple different um, packages within it. So ggplot2, we'll be talking about uh, really kind of taking a bit of a deep dive as we talk about um, the, uh, the data visualization. dplyr, where a lot of the things we'll be talking about today other things to note, so we sort of touched upon this earlier. It's telling us it masks other, uh, other packages' commands. So I think in the first week, uh, there may have been a question about, for example, is there a central repository of, uh, of these packages? And it's really important to note, because R is open source, technically anybody can be writing these, and there's, they sometimes may have the same name. So the reason that it always has you run library and then the name of the package before using its commands is there may be equivalent commands in a different package that need to be uh, masked or turned off basically in some way. Uh, and so there, this, this is one uh, set of commands that I find are really helpful and really nice. So we talked about using that if else for making dichotomies. Uh, it can also be really helpful for just sort of creating subsets of our data in a way that can be very quick and allow us to jump to analyzing it uh, much faster than sort of the base R commands. Um, so one that we have on the screen here is called filter. And basically what filter, filter will do, and I don't remember exactly what names I used in my, uh, or let's do summary NYC dollar age group. So in mine, I've got youngest, middle, and age. So good, that will match. 
basically, let's say we wanted, we are only interested in running analysis on the youngest group. Maybe we've got an even bigger data set than this. Uh, when we eventually start pulling in some, uh, some ex uh, gene expression data, maybe we're only interested in one of the, uh, you know, types of uh, mice, for example, or, or uh, so on. Uh, or for that matter, we could be interested in pulling in a specific gene. So we could create a filter, or create a subset rather, using filter. And so the format and the format for these, uh, these tidyverse commands is often going to be similar. So first we're gonna just give it the name of the data or the data frame, in this case, NYC. And then we're saying uh, age group in all caps equals equals youngest. Things to note, it really matters that the casing matches exactly. Also, if we only did one equals and not equals equals, uh, the command won't follow it because equals means something different in R. So we're calling it youths. We can see up here there's 498 rows of 24 variables. So the same set of columns going across, but just the youths. Uh, so this can be a nice way to sort of only look at specific groups within our data set. Uh, so I mentioned just now the equals equals. So that will mean equals to. A single equal sign in general is going to be similar to that arrow. It looks a little bit weird in this slide, but you'll just have to take my word. That's the regular arrow with a hyphen. Uh, and some, some, uh, some functions will have uh, the equal sign will pop up. For example, uh, it will be something like size equals 100. So if we're running like a sample of something of a, of a data frame, you might sometimes have the equals actually be sort of have meaningful syntax within the command. Uh, I realize that may be confusing to think about right now. In general, though, if we're trying to say, for, for example, that we want to set uh, a filter to be equal to some value, we're going to use the double equals. The single equals, by and large, is going to mean the assign feature. Um, so uh, other things. Also, ignore this, this little um, single quotation mark. I did that. It was giving me problems when I was formatting, and that seems like the easiest way to deal with it. But so you can do greater than, uh, greater than or equal to, less than, less than or equal to. You can do and and or using the and. The or is uh, if above the backslash. Uh, so on my keyboard, at least, above return, if you hold shift backslash, you get that vertical line. And if you do it twice. And then exclamation equals is not equal to. Uh, and again, if you're getting error messages, it can be helpful just to sort of look up this information, which is available online. Uh, so you could combine these in different ways to get, uh, to sort of filter down your data frame. One thing I will note, typically uh, when you're doing an or or an and, you do need to provide the uh, variable name again. So if you want to do age group is youngest or middle, you'd need to do age group is youngest uh, or age group is middle. You couldn't do age group equals youngest or middle. I'll actually write that. So if we did this, if we just did, so this was or, uh, this should not work, which should give me an error. Yes. And I'll give this a different name. I'm not sure that we actually refer back to this. Use and middle. And youths and middles about twice as large, 391 plus 498. Does that seem right? Is that, no, that's everybody. So there is a, some error. Uh, I would need to double check and troubleshoot that, but not gonna worry about it too much for right now. Um, uh, but these are the, the main sort of logical operators that we're going to see uh, within this. Uh, there's also a, uh, a function called by, which might be useful on a similar note. So basically it will be looking at, uh, let's see, this one has some NAs, but basically it will be running a given command, breaking it down by this item here. So by diabetes, uh, giving us the mean ACR. 
Uh, and that can just be another thing that can be nice to be aware of, that you can sort of use that to subset our data when we've got, for in this case, uh, categorical uh, or factor variables of diabetes. Uh, you can also uh, combine uh, these terms and make subsets that meet certain criteria. So maybe you want gene expression levels above some threshold, uh, and maybe you only want uh, high, high cholesterol individuals. So we did that in a previous screen. So that, that, this can be a nice time to think about things uh, like this pipe. So this may be uh, sort of putting the cart before the horse. This is specific to these tidyverse commands. Uh, it can make life a little bit easier as we start doing more and more complex uh, analysis for uh, doing things like select and filter. So we're trying to get individual pieces of information. Basically what it does, the pipe does, it says take whatever's to the left of it and throw it in the, the, uh, the command to the right. So going back a few, so we'll note here it just says age group equals youngest. If we look at uh, when we did it on the first time, we had to say filter NYC age group equals youngest. And for, for one set, it's not too much of a, an ordeal to put NYC. But if we're going to then keep drilling down into our data set uh, or into our table, we may want to simplify things. Uh, otherwise, we may have to uh, give this a name and then select on that if we want to just the lead column. Uh, so it can be nice to, uh, to use this pipe, which just sort of takes what's to the left and runs it into what's to the right to sort of shorten down our work. Uh, and again, this maybe isn't going to be something you're going to be using right away, but if you see that written, uh, it might be very good just to be aware of what that's doing is it's taking what's to the left and running it through the commands to the right and so on. Um, so I've talked about uh, the commands. So we've talked about apply, we've talked about for loops, we've talked about if else statements. We talked about one package so far uh, which is called the, um, the tidyverse, which contains a lot of uh, convenient commands for doing data cleaning. Uh, one other thing I'm going to note right now is a website called Bioconductor, which may be useful for those of you doing bioinformatics tasks. If you do find yourself using one of their packages, uh, for whatever reason, they, at least on my computer, so a sort of NYU Langone issued uh, MacBook Air, I often get issues when I try to use install.packages. So what I honestly find to be a little easier is just to Google it, bioconductor.org. I've clearly looked it up before. Uh, and if we go in, they have a lot of these different packages. Whoops. So if I go in, I can see what's there. Let the wheel spin a little. And again, this is sort of definitely not, you know, once we get into the actual bioinformatics side of things, not my expertise area, but some of these may be things that you do use as you're coming through your work. Uh, and if you wanted to just install any of them, I would recommend going in, scrolling down, it will have some instruction and you can copy this and install it. So it notes uh, to install with uh, version 3.6 and after. When I've tried to use install.packages, it tends to give me this warning uh, that this that the install.packages version only works with 3.5 and before. So that is why I'm sort of saying I recommend going to bioconductor.org, finding this sort of command. I think maybe once you've gotten it once, you could do bioc manager install the package and it comes here to uh, to download it. Uh, mostly mention it, so it's a kind of just you remember it's a quirk. Uh, and as you're going forward, if you do find yourself working with a package and it comes from, for in this case, Bioconductor, but there may be other uh, examples like this, that sometimes the installed up packages isn't going to uh, work quite the way we had hoped and work the way we wanted. And it may be necessary to just find it online. And this is one case uh, that may be relevant to, to all of you, just to be aware of that you can get these things, even if you're getting this warning does not work with your current version uh, of R. Oops. So here, as we have on the other slides, uh, some sort of uh, take home practice things that you can try on your own to really practice out uh, using the R materials. Uh, and these again are available through OneDrive, which is linked through the 
bioinformatics page, uh, the, uh, this here. Uh, so hopefully everybody does have uh, some degree of access at this point. Um, and so that sort of is going to conclude that section of the materials. Um, so I think I'm going to move on to the next, but before we jump into data visualization, I just want to double check, uh, sort of see if there are questions in the chat or if people are feeling comfortable. And I realize I've gone over a lot of things pretty quickly. And I think the main thing to, to realize is that these, these sort of commands will sort of come through uh, experience and through practice to get things working. Okay, so I'm gonna jump into data visualization. Uh, maybe a little bit more fun than for loops. Uh, so hopefully by the end of the day, uh, or you know, the end of the, the section of slides since it's already 3.30, uh, you'll have a sense of being able to explore your data and why you might do that. And a very common reason might be, for example, to assess the uh, normality or the, the skew, uh, kind of flip side of the same concept uh, of your data. Uh, you'll have a sense of how to create a basic heat map as the class moves forward, you may dive into more, you'll probably almost certainly dive into more complex heat maps uh, that are available uh, for conducting uh, bioinformatics research. Uh, you will be able to use a tool like, uh, like ggplot2, which is really, uh, some, of the, some of the data visualizations we'll do are pretty simple. Something like ggplot2, you can do pretty complex things. And by complex, I mean, you can really customize down to very specific degrees how you want your charts and figures to display, uh, which can be great for, let's say you need to make a figure for a paper or a poster, really getting it just the way you want. Since a lot of the out of the box R charts, you'll probably say, oh, I recognize these, I see these all the time, but they could, uh, I think we can all agree, maybe look a little nicer and when it's going out into the world, it can be nice. Uh, and yeah, so being able to customize those colors and shapes. So, uh, if you have not gotten the, I guess it's, there's no real way to copy and paste this easily. Maybe I'll do it into the chat. I'm actually not sure that that will work for everyone, but might as well just to be able to get the, uh, the data in. Still working off of the same exact data, though later when we get to heat maps, we will be pulling in a different type uh, or a different uh, data frame of data. Uh, and so, there's really two big reasons, at least that I can think of, that we may want to visualize our data. Exploration and communication. So by exploration, really what I mean is getting a sense of what is the nature of our data. And it can be very quick relative to, uh, you know, reviewing a table of numbers uh, to really get a sense. So an example I mentioned on the previous slide, uh, is our data, for example, normally distributed? If it is or is not, that's really going to have ramifications, uh, let's see, oh, yeah. uh, that's going to have ramifications for, um, you know, what types of hypothesis tests, for example, if we can run a t-test versus the, for example, the, um, you know, the Mann-Whitney test, for example. So that's going to be relevant uh, for how we can actually work with, analyze, and ultimately, hopefully, gain insights from our data. Uh, so in the first class, we talked about a few different ways you might get an, a general overview of our data. So we talked about summary, uh, we talked about stat, dis well, stat desk, but stat describe from a package called pastex. We talked about psych, uh, which has a uh, command called describe, and there's a lot of these. And I'm sure as you sort of go through in your work, you'll find uh, whichever command works best for you or whichever, you know, just feels easiest for your workflow, uh, you will definitely find that and that will make sense for getting a sense. Uh, but it can be really helpful to have a sense of what's in our data frame, what the general types of data we've pulled in are. Even if it's data we ourselves have collected, it can just be helpful to really, uh, A, get a sense of what's in there and B, make sure that it actually has uh, read in correctly. You know, we've done some sort of, for getting results back, uh, from say uh, some sort of gene expression data, but it's all coming back, you know, completely formatted and sanely. We're, we're going to know that something has gone awry in our read-in process. 
Uh, so one example of, uh, which I keep mentioning is if it's normally distributed. Uh, and so a quick way to get sense of this is uh, looking at a picture. So some of those other uh, summary type packages. So when we talked about the psych describe and the pastex stat desk, uh, those do provide information on how skewed it is. Uh, but it can be much quicker to just sort of pull up uh, what's called a histogram. And so fortunately, uh, R provides pretty quick out of the box uh, histogram building functions. And a lot of statisticians will tell you really kind of one of the first things they recommend doing is taking a look at your data. Uh, because again, you're going to know without having to think about, oh, what does, you know, if you, if you see the number skew is 0.4, you may say, okay, that's less than one, so I'm okay with that, or so on. But you do have to do some mental translation as to what that means. Whereas the uh, great thing about visualizations, apologies that these displayed so, so lengthily, is very quickly we can see uh, that we've got our right skew on glucose and lead, and our roughly, we're going to call it roughly normal distribution on cholesterol. And if we go up, we can see the command for this was just hist, and then the uh, column of data we were interested in. So it does not really require too many, um, too many arguments right out to get the basic, you know, readable, legible thing. It does sort of annoy me that the default always extends past the y axis, but that's neither here nor there. And actually, just to sort of review what we're looking at, uh, in case that is not apparent. So the histogram is uh, basically making roughly, essentially, a count of each of these values. So they, in this case, it's, it's doing what's called binning. So it's separating this into groups, because these are all continuous values from most of these are under, uh, you know, in the 0 to 1 range. But then they do have some outliers that go all the way up to 15. In the case of cholesterol, they all fall roughly between 100 and 350 at the highest, uh, and so on. And they're just saying how many people are in the, in this case, it looks like it's probably, uh, you know, one, we'll say 175 to 190 or so. Uh, we could specify what we want those bins to be, but it's basically just saying, okay, there's uh, well over probably about 225 people in this group and so on. So it's more or less just a way of giving us essentially counts of these uh, populations and it can uh, really quickly uh, help put these up, these up. Uh, so you can also do extra things. So you could, for example, uh, give it a color if you wanted, if you want it to be a little bit more, uh, you know, eye catching. I tend to always go with the steel blue just because I think it's visually pleasing. Uh, let's see. And one other thing I'll note about the previous one, which mostly I'm mentioning uh, because for right now, you don't need to worry too much. This par thing basically is saying plot more than one uh, chart at a time, so a row of one by three. Uh, for today, really the only thing I'm interested in you walking away with is just remembering, if you need a histogram, hist of whatever you're trying to get the histogram of, uh, no need to worry about this top thing if that was unclear. Um, so yeah, you can also change the, the colors, for example. Uh, similar to a histogram in terms of its utility, though not in terms of its appearance, will be a box plot. And very conveniently, R has a built-in uh, command of box plot. Uh, so here, let's say we want that same cholesterol total. We already saw that we felt like the uh, cholesterol total was more or less uh, normally distributed. Um, and in this case, so what we're looking at here is going to just be, it's providing the median, it's providing the quartiles, it's also providing the outliers, uh, which are by default one and a half times uh, from the uh, interquartile range below or above the quartiles. Uh, and so you could get a sense of if this is skewed, again, if uh, everything, if the say the median was way down here or the median was way up here, you could get a sense of if it was skewed. You could also, for example, turn this on its side, which might help uh, sort of intuitively get a sense of is it skewed right or left as well. Uh, it's maybe less intuitive to think if this median line here is down near here that that means right skewed and vice versa. 
Uh, but it can be a good way to get a sense of uh, how your data is distributed. Uh, there's also a nice feature of uh, box plots within R is that you can do comparisons of multiple groups. So here we've got cholesterol total by gender and the way we're telling it by is with this tilde, which on my keyboard again on this, uh, this Mac keyboard is next to the one. If I hold shift, there's an accent and the tilde is next to the one. Uh, and that is pretty frequently used uh, within R for uh, sort of breaking apart. So here it's being used to tell us that we're breaking apart our data by, uh, by gender, by the gender uh, column. And we can see the cholesterol. From just eyeballing it, it looks like there's probably not too much of a difference between those two. Uh, and that can be uh, useful if, again, if you're trying to get that quick sense of A, how is my data distributed? B, how do my two groups roughly compare to one another? If they're very far apart, it may tell you that there really is some sort of difference. Uh, you can also do things, for example, adding the notch equals true, which can be a way to get a sense of if there's a significant overlap. Uh, and it can be a sort of a uh, quick way to say, do I think that there's likely to be, uh, you know, a significant difference? Definitely want to sow as much caution and wariness of discussions or focusing primarily on statistical significance as possible. Uh, but it can be a good way to get a sense is, is the difference between these two medians, which don't line up 100%. If the notches overlap or don't overlap, that can be a good sort of a uh, quick visual tool for getting a sense, is it likely that these two groups are actually different if I was to run a test on them, or is it just that they actually, the confidence intervals overlap and they're roughly the same? Uh, I see there's a question about adding access labels. There will definitely be, especially as we go into, um, into ggplot, definitely ways to get those access labels. Uh, if you have a one and a two, it might be the case uh, that when it, the data was pulled in, it may not have had the, uh, the levels assigned for a factor. So that's something you could explore to sort of review those factor commands using levels. So the default is one and two. I don't remember. I actually do happen to have uh, the uh, data dictionary open. So if you went to, if you really wanted to double check, you go to Haynes Codebook and look it up but we won't spend too much time on that right now. Uh, but just a, a way to assign those labels to be more exact. Uh, as we go into ggplot2, which is again, much more comprehensive than these kind of quick uh, out of the box sort of uh, visualizations for data exploration, we'll really be taking a deep dive on how you could rename the labels. You could put in any information you want. You could even, if you really wanted, you could put in like Greek characters and things. Uh, which we won't worry about for this class, but just being aware that you can do a lot more uh, flexible things. You could also, again, you could assign this color uh, if you wanted to make things sort of pop out a little bit more. Uh, another common way that you may see for getting a sense of the, uh, the distribution of your data is by doing a quantile quantile plot, QQ plot. And basically what this can be used is uh, getting a sense of, um, again, for the, the distribution, very quick, you can do, I've done, again, this uh, row, two, two columns, one row, so side by side. Uh, and we can do the QQ norm for, in this case, cholesterol total. And this main is just giving it this header. The default, for whatever reason, just says, normal QQ plot. It doesn't tell you the variable. So that's why I've written in main because otherwise these are just side by side and it's impossible to know which. And then also adding in this, uh, this normal line for if the values are falling uh, close or not. And basically the way we could read this is the closer to the line, it's sort of saying these, uh, the going on the x-axis, what we would expect uh, if the data was normally distributed, so if it was just a random collection of normal data, uh, how close to this line, so if it's on this exactly, it, we would expect it to be normally distributed. 
but in this case where we've got a lot of skew and unfortunately the data in this uh, data frame has a lot of skew. So as we go forward, you'll see I'm doing a lot with cholesterol, not so much with the other variables. Uh, and again, the reason is going to be because of that uh, relatively normal distribution as opposed to something here where it's really jumping way off. So again, I'm mostly showing this just to be kind of a quick way that we can get a sense of how is our data distributed and you can just give it the QQ norm of the value and QQ line of the same and it will quickly uh, give you that information. Um, Okay, uh, often it will also be beneficial to uh, create a uh, scatter plot to see, get a, again, a general sense by looking at our data. If the, uh, if the data seems to have some sort of correlation uh, or if it looks totally random uh, or you know, uncorrelated or if there's some sort of negative correlation. And this again can just be done with the out of the box commands to use plot and it's going to have the first um, first column of data, the first variable, and then a comma in the second. So in this case, we're saying uh, the A1C and glucose. I'm going to scroll down just a little. We can see it looks like there may be some correlation. It does sort of seem to go up, which makes complete sense in this case. They're not measures of the exact same thing, but they are very related sort of measures. They both are measuring blood sugar in some capacity. Uh, so we, it makes sense that as one goes up, the other seems to. Uh, we could test too if it is. We'll talk a little bit more about these sort of tests uh, going forward. Uh, and yeah, we can see it has a very small p-value. Again, want to uh, offer caution about p-values, but for right now, just getting a sense that perhaps our visual intuition may be correct. Uh, Sometimes you will have the case where you have very uh, extreme outliers and it may be very difficult to visualize as a result. So there are transformations that may make it more manageable. Uh, the main thing that we're going to want to note is that if we are doing these sort of transla translations that we uh, do them to both. So we wouldn't want to compare, for example, the log of glucose to just cholesterol total because that wouldn't be as meaningful. But if we do both, we can get a sense sort of pulling them onto the same scale uh, if anything is sort of leaping out. This looks pretty uncorrelated uh, un to me, but then just uh, to get a sense. So it is also possible to make uh, visualizations of transformed data uh, to make it more visible to see sort of what's going on, especially if you have extreme outliers. Uh, the data does not need to be in the form of it. So we're currently using data in the form of uh, a data frame, uh, that NYC data. And this is responding to a question in the chat. Uh, and this just has to be numeric data. Something that can be nice to note is that R tries to guess for us the type of, um, the type of data. I mean, it knows the type of data, but it tries to guess what chart is going to make sense with that. So if I go back here, I say plot and let's, so the, that was an example of the correlation was doing numeric data. But let's say uh, we do uh, NYC DX DBTS. If I just do that, it should just do column charts of each. So it's saying most in this data uh, frame have no diabetes. And that's because if we look at the class D oops, NYC dollar DX diabetes, it's a factor. So we could even, I think, combine, if we did NYC gender, oh wait, I think it might be the tilde. Oh, I'm doing class, that's why I, and we could sort of break it down by, uh, in this case, so you got male and female. This is a bit hard to read, especially because uh, the uh, middle group is so small and we'd want to, if we really, you know, especially if we want to work with this, we may want to, you know, do things to make this more visually pleasing. But I guess the, the takeaway is to do these basic plots, you can just work in a data frame. And the type of chart that a tool like plot is going to give you is going to vary based on the type of data 
So the reason that those scatter plots are showing up here is these are both continuous. Uh, so cholesterol is continuous, glucose is continuous. And so it just says, okay, continuous by continuous, you probably want a scatter plot. We could even specify if we wanted, for example, lines instead of uh, scatter plots. Uh, we could go in, we could say, so hopefully I'm not uh, mixing up in my head. So let's say we had total of cholesterol total, excuse me. And it doesn't really matter, cadmium. So let's say we did something like that. We could actually even specify type equals L. Whoa, that looks crazy, but it is technically possible. Uh, I forget all the types. We could say plot. Let's see, what else is there? Uh, let's try uh, and so on. So these are sort of the base options that come with uh, come with plot. I will definitely admit that it's sort of the uh, the sort of thing that plot and these basic histogram commands, hist, box plot, they can be great for getting a sense of really quick, uh, you know, really quick data exploration. How is my data distributed? How are, uh, you know, how can I analyze my data? When we get to the point where we're going to want to change, um, you know, change sort of the customization, I, and I think many people often lean back on a tool like ggplot, package like ggplot. Uh, the reason being that it has a lot more commands uh, available for us uh, that make it a little bit easier to the point that then it can be hard to remember changing things like the type uh, and so on. So the next thing we're going to start, I think we probably, I will be surprised if we really finish this section of today's uh, command or uh, today's lesson. So we may jump back here to review heat maps. Uh, and this will be a time, so this actually segues nicely with the question about types of data where we are going to be doing a visualization tip that's going to actually require a, um, a uh, what's the word, uh, a matrix. So I'm going to pass this along. I'll do it one line at a time in the Zoom so people can have this. So that's the first line. Oh, uh, please be aware, I didn't realize I caught part of library R curl. That is an error. So just either have our curl running, but don't run Y R curl. That will not work correctly. And actually, I'll just go ahead. Uh, so this is real uh, data that was uh, graciously given to us to work with for this purpose uh, from Dr. Dolgolev of uh, uh, normalized counts. Okay. And if I wanted to get a quick sense of things, again, I could say head, it's kind of a long name, but it, at least it pops up, so. And we can see, just to sort of give us a sense of what we are actually looking at. So we've got a column of genes. Uh, we have uh, the uh, wild type. So four of each type of, uh, I think it's four. Yes, four of each type, sorry, of, uh, of these wild type mice that were sampled. So one, two, and then uh, seven and eight. The WT is letting us know that these are wild type. Three through six uh, have some knockout gene. And we can see the expression for these different genes going through. So a lot of zeros in this top set, but some of them more, uh, more, more information expressed. Uh, so I, for the purposes of this demonstration and not for reality, I'm actually going to go ahead and just take a subset of this. Uh, the reason that I am taking a subset is my, if we try to make a heat map of the whole, how many rows was it? 52,000. It's going to spin for kind of a while in a way that is not going to be ideal. 
So this next part is just for demonstration purposes, is not for data analysis purposes. There may be definitely times that you may want to take a subset of your data. However, if you're doing uh, this sort of, if you're making heat maps, it does not make sense to arbitrarily just choose the, the top 2000 rows. I just did that for the sake of uh, convenience. So I'll just call it small Dolgolev because it's his data and this is a small subset. And what did I do? I said Dolgolev. And I'm actually going to leave out, so uh, we're going to one to 2000. I'm going to leave out the first column of data. We'll tell why that will be the case. I'm hoping I can get through this part. We might have to pick up redoing this next time. Uh, but then two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, through nine. So what I'd like to do with my small set is I'm going to, for the moment, keep the names off of it. Uh, so I sort of may have given a clue as to why I'm doing this uh, when I mentioned the data structure that we're going to be working with. Um, but just be aware that is something I'm doing. So I'm getting the first 2,000 columns and only the columns that contain uh, expression data, not the what I would think of as the labels. Um, so we basically just did that. So head would give us this, uh, but without the, um, the information. Incidentally, if you're interested in more information on how, this, how the actual results in this table were generated, there is this link here. I'll give that to you in the chat and you could explore that on your own. Uh, and then the next thing we can do is we can actually see what type of data are we working with. So again, doing something we've been doing for a few weeks now, we can see it's a data frame. But I already know, let's say I wanted to do heat map of a data frame. It's going to give me an error because for heat maps, uh, it wants a numeric matrix, which makes sense. It's not going to want to make a heat map of either things that it doesn't know are all the same or, for example, text. Uh, there are cases actually where if you did like what text is greater than another, it will do it based on alphabetical order, but we don't really need to worry about that. That won't be too meaningful. Uh, so what we can do is I'm going to take this, so I'm saying as a matrix, so taking the same data set and turning it into a matrix. So I'm going to do that over here. So overwriting itself with as matrix. We can see again, just hit up twice, three times. And we can even see uh, we want to make sure it's numeric. We don't want those to be, for example, sometimes it may trick you. You may have think you have numbers, but then when you do that, it says text. So we got we did not carry over that first column because of that. And then what I want to do is I want to take those first 2,000 rows of the full data uh, data frame, the Dogolev uh, normalized RNA, and feed that over as row names of this new one. So just to illustrate, row dot names. And I will do uh, one to 2,000, whoops, and just that first column. So just to, I'll, I'll, just to illustrate what we pulled in, I won't take all of them, but let's say we just want to see the first 10, one. That first column of the full, uh, full data frame for the full uh, RNA counts was the, just the names of the genes. And that's why I took the first column and fed it over as row names. And now if I just look at the head of small, we can see now we have this, it's presenting, but it's not actually part of the data. It's still a data frame uh, that we can now start to work with. So I'm gonna hold off on jumping into the actual heat maps. Uh, the, a lot of the work has been done at this point and sort of, conclude for today. Again, I'm going to remind you as you sign up, please refrain from adding any chats, uh, you know, saying goodbye or anything like that. Uh, for our TAs, it's really where they're answering questions. So just uh, if you can leave the, the chat to asking questions, we're happy to try to answer any questions you may have. And we will pick up on Thursday to discuss uh, more about data visualization. Uh, so thank you for your time and have a great uh, so I guess if you have, I mean, the, the thing, the, the main thing is you could actually pull this whole 
uh, .rmd file from the OneDrive account. Uh, otherwise, if you have data that you want to save, I would save it in the scripting pane and just save it as a .r file with a name that you'll remember, sort of your, your notes from today. Um, so yeah, so thank you uh, for your time. I think we can, I think I can maybe even stop